Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. And joining us again from Portland, Oregon, is Hal Burton. Hal's a staff reporter at the Seattle Times for the last 10 years. He's reported from Afghanistan. He was embedded with the 5th Striker Brigade, 2nd Infantry Division. And he's covering the stories of the soldiers charged with murdering civilians for sport. Thanks for joining us, Hal. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. In the first segment, we talked about uh, five soldiers who have been charged with deliberately killing civilians in Afghanistan as a kind of killing club or for sport in some way. Uh, other soldiers have been charged with other crimes in that unit, uh, some of them for attempting to kill civilians, if I understand it correctly, and for drug use. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the bigger context. First of all, we hear many reports that a great number of soldiers are using anti-anxiety drugs, are smoking uh, either marijuana or using hashish. It's a very drug-induced atmosphere. So first of all, do, when you're experienced there, do you find that's true? And, and what role do you think it might play in all of this? Well, I'd like to say that what I've seen is, yes, for legal prescription drugs, that's been very well documented. Uh, the Army has talked about that issue. Uh, the question of how many soldiers are actually smoking hashish or illegal drugs, I don't know that that's a big number. I certainly did not see that when I was there. Uh, yes, the Afghan police were smoking hashish. The Afghan uh, police were, were very much involved in drugs and such. But the soldiers I was with, when I was embedded, were not. But are, are the anti-anxiety drugs, and, and apparently some of them are pretty powerful, uh, perhaps even more problematic in the sense of what it might do to one's judgment. And, 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 and then the underlying issue is, is this normal anxiety about fighting in a war, or is this fighting in a war that people don't, soldiers don't seem to understand? One of the things you have to realize is there's been a tremendous amount of IED attacks in southern Afghanistan, as there was in Iraq. Thus, there have been a lot of concussive events. Many soldiers uh, are prescribed prescription drugs after these concussive events. Uh, certainly, one of the soldiers who we know, uh, Specialist Jeremy Morlock, was implicated in the murders, had been involved in four different, according to his attorney, uh, explosions that had resulted in some concussions. And he was actually being medically evacuated at the time he was questioned. So he, I don't really think you can make uh, any sort of parallel between being on these drugs and this uh, type of activity because lots of people are having to use prescription drugs and as far as we know there's not widespread conduct like this that's alleged within the army so I think that that you really have to be careful about uh, linking trying to draw uh, some links between those two things. The Ar Army is saying that this activity is, of this group was an aberration. Um, do you get a sense that is the case, or is the aberration more of this hasn't come to light? Well, as far as I know, uh, this is an aberration. When I was in Afghanistan, I was in uh, another uh, battalion in the same striker brigade as this unit. And those soldiers... Uh, really were working very hard to try to win the confidence of the Afghan civilians so that basically they could get their mission accomplished, which was trying to improve security, reopen schools, find out where the Taliban were hiding and all those types of things. And I saw them at their moment of greatest anguish when there was a possibility that mortars from the unit had accidentally killed uh, some civilians and young boys, and they had had to treat these uh, uh, civilians and spend uh, a long day getting them medically evacuated. And after that, they were just uh, emotionally distraught. So the last thing they wanted to do was basically undercut what they were doing by deliberately killing civilians. I saw uh, them reach out to civilians. A few months ago on The Real News, we interviewed a young soldier and he described in boot camp uh, a situation where the killing of civilians was part of your training in a sense that they actually, he claims, marched uh, in, in, to a chant which had to do with going down to the market and killing women and children. One that stands out in my mind is, it goes, um, I went down to the market where all the women shop. I pulled out my machete and I began to chop. I went down to the park where all the children play. I pulled out my machine gun and I began to spray. 
to take ordinary people out of American civilian life and get them prepared for a theater of war. Uh, in, in any situation with any community, a certain percentage of people, you could say, might be predisposition to a kind of sociopathy, certainly not the majority. But give that kind of training and give that kind of a war, is there a problem that the, at the senior levels of the armed forces, where they want to maintain a sort of militancy and a willing to go out and fight and die and kill, that these kinds of people aren't suppressed, that there's not a serious enough action taken to stop this kind of well, stuff? Certainly, there's been talk that the Army itself needs to focus more on its training standards. There's been a lot of talk about uh, rebuilding garrison life after a long periods of rapid deployment of trying to, uh, there's concerns about alcoholism, illegal drug use, and other things within the force, and a sense of needing to get a better uh, discipline on Army life and allowing for longer times between deployments, a sense that the Army is stretched. That's been expressed by a lot of the Army leaders, and there is a focus there. I don't know about that training. Of course, I've never witnessed anything like that. All I could say is that when you do see a Taliban fighter, he, he's not wearing some Taliban uniform that, that, that everybody with his rank and insignia. So it is a difficult uh, fight. Um, that said, there's been a huge focus, first under McChrystal and continued under Petraeus, about actually trying to avoid killing civilians. And even to the point where they've issued some guidance talking about what they called courageous restraint, which was celebrating the actions of soldiers who put their own lives at risk to avoid killing civilians in a dicey situation. And actually, those types of rules have triggered a little bit of a backlash from soldiers who are saying that their hands are tied, that the rules of engagement are too strict, that after all, they're infantry soldiers, they're trained to close and destroy on an enemy force, and that's what they're supposed to do. And, and of course, Petraeus even did uh, call for some review of, of those rules of engagement. So I really think there's been an effort to improve the safeguards for the civilian population for the very simple reason is they've said that if we harm too many of the civilians, we're not going to win this fight. How do people explain this apparently reluctance to listen to the father of one of the soldiers to try to report this? I mean, there seemed to be, uh, the Army did not seem very interested in finding out about this story. You know, we just learned of, of, of this last week, uh, reviewed some of the initial documents. We're still digging into that. Um, there seemed to be, if what he says is accurate, a pretty significant breakdown. How that happened, where it happened, because I've talked with folks in the field who say that they never got any sort of heads up from that February, uh, from those February calls. So why that happened, we don't, I don't really okay, know Okay, wh what's next? When do they expect this to come to trial? Well, the trials will, uh, first there's something called an Article 32 hearing. That's where each soldier uh, has a hearing where they decide, is there enough evidence to move ahead with a court-martial trial? And those Article 32 hearings are expected over the next few months, and then there'll be trials. Some people, of course, might opt to plead out uh, prior to a trial. We, we have no idea. Maybe some charges will be dropped or tossed out. But this process is going to unfold over months for sure, and uh, we're still trying to get a sense of who will actually go to trial. Thanks very much for joining us, Hal. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.